Hey, I, I, this sounds like it works. Maybe it works. Too, too well. It does. Uh, okay, uh, so if there's a problem, you just tell me to stop and we'll adjust it. Probably, probably it's okay without this. No, no we no. need it. You need it. Okay, it's, it's a pleasure a pleasure to be here. Uh, Daniela DeRio and I have a, a joint project that we're working on this fall to investigate plan, planning and innovative planning work. And if I forget at the end, I won't forget now, I will ask you for suggestions of, oh, you must talk to so-and-so. You know, if there's somebody who you think is really doing wonderful work in planning fields, and especially with respect to uh, issues of conflict, issues of difference, issues of community politics, uh, then we want, we want to know. So, my, my work for many years has been to study planners. Now this is difficult for some people to understand who want to study cities. But you can study both. And my preoccupation is to study planners, the people who wear two shoes, or not shoes as the case may be, the people who say, I, my work, my vocation, my mission in life is to improve cities. So I Many people want to understand the city as a system, what the beautiful city can be, the just city, and so on. I respect that enormously, but I, I want to ask the further question, which is once you have a compelling idea of the just city and the beautiful city, what in the world can you do in practice to realize that idea? to make it not only abstractly possible, but to make it actual. Yeah? So you have to forgive me. I'm not going to talk to you much. I talked to you a little bit about the city. But my preoccupation is the practice of the planners, of the change agents. Because otherwise, I am worried as an American pragmatist. Otherwise, I'm worried that we have lots of great ideas, and they go absolutely nowhere. Is it clear? So I'm worried about how to translate, how to go from the idea to the actuality, to bring it into the world. And, and that is not a criticism of the people who study the city. It's to say, I'm doing something a little differently. I'm an anthropologist. And the natives that I study are planners. So for many years, I have sat in the conference rooms of the city planning staff of municipalities in the city hall. And my colleagues who study cities, they said, what could be more boring? <laughs> than to sit in a, in a bureaucracy in the city hall and, and listen to these planners. But for an anthropologist of planning, it's one of the only places where you can listen to how they talk to each other when they, when they say, when they are free of the politicians, free of the neighborhood, free of the, the developers beating up on them. They are together saying, oh my god, what are we going to do now? <laughs> How do we handle this? How do we handle that? How do we get this done? So for me to sit in a staff meeting isn't boring at all. It is an opportunity to explore the imagination of the planners. What do they have in their heads? How are they discussing what they should do? What they should do. Not only what they want, but what they should do. Right? So, so sometimes I say that I study the micro-politics, the micro-politics of planning, not the structural politics so much as the micro-politics 
at the level of everyday life. Who, who, who gets the phone call and who does not get the phone call? Who is invited? Who is consulted? Who is not consulted? What do the planners say? What do the planners not say? What information do they share? How do they frame a problem? All of those kind of problems. It's the day-to-day -day micro practical politics of the work. Right? And I am interested in that not as an empirical social scientist who wants to find out the, the, the trends or the prevailing practice. I'm not interested in the ordinary or the typical. I'm interested in the person who pushes the boundary. I'm interested in the person who shows us a new way of involving people, who thinks about power in a more creative way than most of the profession. So I'm looking at the people who are, you might say, the leading edge. And if I interview 20 people in the hope of finding somebody who's really doing something creatively new, if I interview 20 people and I get three or four really good ones, that's fine. Because from three or four really good ones, fresh ideas, you can do a lot. So I'm not trying to study the average planner. I'm trying to study people who are doing new and creative things. And I don't expect that they can theorize it. It's our job to sort of understand the practice and the making the theory. In the same way that you don't ask a painter to do the theory of painting, you ask a good art critic, and a good art critic can tell you about how this work fits into a history of other work. The painter may be the genius or whatever, however, but the painter doesn't necessarily have to explain it. And so the, I don't expect these people to give me a full theory of what they do. I'm hoping that they can tell me about the practice so that I can say, oh, look, look what they did here. And it's not rocket science. Many of us can do it. So I've written, uh, so this is to say that when I'm doing these empirical studies, <laughs> we're technologically challenged here. <laughs> doing, doing better. Looking at the day-to-day the -day politics, at what, what is done, but what could be, could be better, means that we have to explore the possible, yeah, what's possible, and also the way that we talk about the impossible. But the possible does not appear on a plate, like a serving a dinner that you order. What we think is impossible and possible is a construction of the future that we make. Yeah. And you all know many people who stress, no, 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 the door is locked, the door is locked. They will never do that. That's not possible. That's not possible. And you know other people who are always looking that they're trying the door, they're testing the door, they're seeing, oh, well, the door's not going to go that way. So this, this is, in a way, a, a, a much broader problem of our whole field, is to explore what is possible even when 95% of the people around us say, no, 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 it's really impossible to do much more about poverty, to do much more about inequality, to do much more about the dreadful sprawl. <coughs> but most, most people don't have ambitious idea of possibility. But the, the very vocation of planning, certainly, is, is to think what's possible for our cities and, what can be, and what's possible politically, what can we actually do. So the most interesting definition of planning 
that I would offer to you, and I had written about this for a long time, but I think it's still important to say, the most interesting definition of planning, I think, is not only making plans, and not only guiding future action, as I've written in other places. The, most, the best definition of planning is planning is the organization of hope. So if planners do their work well, if they do their work well, other people will have a more realistic understanding of how their cities and neighborhoods and livelihoods can actually be better. That doesn't say the organization of fantasy. The organization of, of hope, of realistic hope. What is possible in the world? And the more, but notice, the more that planners say, ah, trust me, the more they encourage other people not to hope, not to push, not to organize. So I said this at Cornell for three years, and one of my colleagues, Pierre Cobell, who does similar, some similar work. He said, I don't, I don't understand that. I don't understand that. And once I wrote, so, so planning is the organization or the disorganization of hope. And he said, oh, now I understand. Because he was writing critically about planners who were either too technocratic or with cool people, you know, tell people it'll be okay, we'll take care of it, you know, it would be pacifying. So Pierre was, was very conscious that many times planners disorganize hope. It's the same problem, right? I'm interested in what they can do so that we all, as a public, have a better idea of what's possible in the world. Uh, that, that seems to me, I'm, I'm simply at the definition. That seems to be the vocation of our field. Now, the, the question, of course, is how, you know, how, do, how, how do we do it? And so that's what I have been writing about for quite a while, and I can't give you the tip, I, <laughs> I can't do a history of that. But maybe, it, 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 it's worth saying, that, that's embarrassing. So the, the best book that I published a book in 1989. It was published in Italian. Dino Bori did the translation. Uh, it's called Planning in the Face of Power. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea that it would be as engaging as it was. That it got. I mean, 90% of people, I think, misread the book. Mm -hmm. and, and that would be a second, that would be a separate lecture. But there was a phase there in which I was trying to take the work of, of the German philosopher and sociologist um, who was writing not only about German idealism, Kant and Hegel and so on, but he was also writing about pragmatism. And most of the left never understood Habermas's interest in pragmatism. And, and so they only read Habermas as an idealist, which is a big problem. In any case, we, we, we will leave time for questions. If anybody's really fascinated by that, we can talk about it later. I'm happy. I'm here until Natale. I am happy to talk to anybody who's interested in these kind of, and very similarly obsessed. Uh, nevertheless, I, I was interested in this work 
not as philosophy, but as it informed day-to-day -day practice. And so the title essay, the essay in Planning and Face of Power that had the same title, came about after I was watching the health, health planning meetings locally, and I said, if Habermas is right, what does that say about the work of Jennifer Bass, who's sitting there running these meetings? And that forced me to translate the philosophical work into the day-to-day -day practice of Jennifer Bass, <coughs> who was our local health planner. And I realized that a lot of the broader work of Habermas could be explained, could be translated into the work of what you call agenda setting. So we're talking about a problem, and Georgia was asking me about a certain problem, and I said, Georgia, it's really just an economic problem, nothing else. And Daniela says, that's nonsense. It's not an economic problem. It's a cultural problem, because this is the way people present questions of value. And if you look at it as an economic problem, you're going to miss the real problem. So this is a matter of framing, right? The world is complex. There is no simple factual description. A factual description is always a selection. And that selection matters, especially in a political environment. The selection is essentially agenda setting and So the, the, whole, the whole planning in the face of power was really an argument about the way that power works in planning as selective attention. Because planners in the United States, in any case, rarely have power of their own in terms of authority of their own. Certainly, they don't make any decisions. But the power that planners have is often information. And there's and there are questions then of the timing of information, the legibility or comprehensibility of the information, who finds out what and when is an important point. And plan it because planners are often in between, let's say, communities like Giovanni in Napoli is in between people in the Spanish Quarter and government apparatus. And depending on what he does with information, he gets different results. Information is one of the things he has to work with, other than his good looks. Yeah? Information is something he So early, early on, I was most focused on issues of power and issues of day-to-day -day practice. And the last word about Habermas, Habermas talked about something called communicative action. Most people, unfortunately, thought he was talking about communication. He's not. Communication is like breathing. We all breathe. To, to talk about communication is really not interesting at all. He was interested in action, how people got things done. And there was a line of work from the British language philosophers, basically. Um, and if you're into John Austin, who said, isn't it interesting? that depending on how we use words, we can accomplish things. We can threaten somebody. We can ask a question. We can insult somebody. We can make a promise. We can say mi dispiace. 
Austin, Austin made a, re a small revolution in early 20th century philosophy by looking at the way that what we did with words changed the world. So you, you can all remember a time when you said something that you wish you had not said. I think for a minute. Mm -hmm. You said something and you said, oh no, what did I do? Right? So that's, that's one of the simplest cases of giving an example where usually it's you know, an affair of the heart, <laughs> sometimes in, in family more generally, but you can say something that really matters. That's just the most obvious case. But in planning cases, what one asks is pretty fundamental. And what one doesn't never asks. So the power of questioning and the other Austin is interesting for the for the, the analysis, but in 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 political, more political context, the work of the Brazilian educator Paulo Freire is absolutely fundamental. He has one wonderful book, and the first 60 pages are basically all you need. The first 60 pages. The book is called The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And Freire, was an educator in Brazil who developed a method that he called not not bank. He said he said normal normal education is banking education. The educator has knowledge and inserts it into Pietro's head. And then Pietro, as a good student, is supposed to understand what the educator has put in. Freire said, this is hierarchical, not very respectful, humanistic. Freire develops a method that he, he described as problem posing. And it was one part, one part Socrates asking questions and getting, asking questions not because he wanted information, asking questions because Socrates knew and Freire knew. When you ask a question, the other person is now asked to think for himself or herself, and to figure something out. And if it's not a simple question you ask, then they have something to wrestle with. And if you do this in a group, if you do this in a group, then it's not only the di dyadic right, interaction, but then the group is learning. So Socratic education more generally, it, is one thing for was in. He put together Socratic education, a Judeo-Christian belief in the humanism and the respect for the person and the dignity of the person, to a broadly left structuralist, soft Marxist analysis so that Freire knew when he asked the question, who owns the land, he wasn't asking a, a, a question with no politics. He was asking people, let's think about who controls what. What do we control, what don't we control? Yeah. So, I, I read this as a graduate student 
And the fairy, the fairy has been translated into 40 languages probably. It made an enormous um, impact on applied professions. But I realized that, that if you wanted to look carefully and systematically at what was really interesting in fairy education, you had to look at Habermas. And so that was the connect. That was in the way the connection came. So that's early, that's early on. After that, after that work, the, this was so focused on the individual speaker. And I had, along the way, done work at MIT. 